Yeah, that's a question. I'm still studying the forest tradition, and uh, I have a really a deep impression from the forest tradition. Yeah, someday I want to introduce the forest tra- tradition into Korea. The, the Korea must be really be a place to see the real Dharma in the forest tradition. Then I'm still wondering, I'm still the, uh, confused about in the forest Dharma is the, about the Samadhi. And when I read the first tradition books, uh, the the terms about samadhi, the abana samadhi and jhana, uh, some group Ajans were using the different words about the state of mind. And it just uh, I was uh, just wondering the, what the Ajancha was using the, to describe the state of mind. The it, it was uh, like the jhana or the abana samadhi with some group achas say the abana samadhi and jhana is the same and some group achas are saying they are totally different so I was still confused about that well like, like if like samatha meditation is you focus on an object you know so you choose a subject like on a breath or casino or whatever and then you concentrate on it and that that will get, you go through you know as you absorb into it then you you have that you become one with the object and then then um, like with um, mindfulness meditation the samadhi is, is on this wider range so it's it's sama samadhi so you're kind of you're you're not focused you're not shutting off anything but you're receiving everything and so it, like one point can be one dot on the floor, or it can be the whole, you know. One it can be the whole completeness, or it can be a point. And so, like, uh, like in, in, I found, what, what I found difficult in the beginning was, uh, trying to get the samadhi through concentrating on an object was was motivated not so much for you know for very much motivated as from a personal need to get something so I I would you know I have I had a lot of willpower and uh, could could make myself do things but even when I did get levels of concentration you know I'd keep losing them you know so you you know you you become I become increasingly more kind of controlling and then uh, when I moved to Watapo with Ajahn Chah then I couldn't you know the ability to con- kind of control the environment I had to more or less receive the environment as, as I experienced it. I had to join a community and work with it so that was more this a sense of mindfulness and awareness in which you 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 then you I found then I began to see this this sense of myself trying to get something so I've always I've always you know for me the the point that I I valued from Ajahn Chah was getting to see the, the obstructions of grasping uh, out of ignorance and uh, which so even when I grasping Buddhist ideas or Buddhist opinions out of ignorance of you know there was still this sense of me and mine in related related to my own practice or my view about Buddhism and then through this so, so I found my real interest lie with the noble truths for noble truths uh, rather than worrying about the levels of samadhi or jhanas and that I uh, you know I became more <coughs> found it more <coughs> interesting to investigate suffering its causes and cessation and, and path rather than spending a lifetime trying to control everything so I can get tranquilized so, and because I did have very tranquil experiences 
in the beginning, and that made me desire to. It created this desire all the time to to have more and more tranquility. And I, and I began to see how that that desire and that grasping out of ignorance was was the problem. And uh, then I began to investigate the Sakya Ditti, this self personality view, and began to witness observing myself, this way I the views I had or the way I thought. Not to criticize, but just to see how wanting to attain Nibbana is certainly <clears throat> you know, a noble uh, aspiration. But coming from ignorance and sakya it, it, you know, it can be, you know, you're grasping the, the idea of it rather than, than actually uh, finding, you know, what that really means in terms of here and now ex- uh, reality. So, and then te- different teachers have, have a, a different ways of practice. So, so you know, there's, this is why it can be confusing because different ajans and that have say don't know samatha or, or you have to have samatha or jhana or you don't need them or I mean it's there's so many conflicting views coming from different teachers but uh, and so you know this is this is where you know that not that any anybody's wrong about it but but what I encourage you to do is see how it affects you, you know. Uh, somebody comes across in a very authoritarian way and says, you're practicing all wrong, you should do it my way. And how does that affect you, you know? You can, at least you can know, you know, whether, you know, you feel, you know, you, it doesn't create doubt or resentment or faith or whatever. So you're more encouraged to observe how you're, you know how how teachers how teachers talk. Like it right now, just observe your own mind how you how you hear me. I'm not asking you to believe me, but to observe. You know what I'm saying. How does that affect you? Now that then you really then you're getting to the source. You know to the to the to the center of of conscious reality of observing rather than figuring out whether I'm right or wrong or what this teacher says and and whose who's, who's, who's view is the right one and trying to figure it out on that level you just end up in confusion so it's it's more encouraging you know, like I see myself more trying to encourage people to awaken rather than than telling them how to practice or, or just trying to start another kind of method of meditation called sound of silence or something I don't want to do that you know it's just uh, <laughs> I don't you know I don't want to to create another method but to you know how I can help you the best is to encourage you to be aware rather than tell you how you should practice because even though I might tell you, you know, very good give you good advice if you're not aware uh, of your, you know, how you're receiving this, and and the reaction and the result of what I say, how you, how your reactions you have. Even though I might give you good advice, it's still it's still not coming from your awareness. It's coming from Ajahn Sumedho said you should do it like this, and that's not that's not you know it doesn't work like that. It's, it's like learning to to trust yourself to be aware. And, and say, recognize this is this is what you can actually recognize and know, and then how what other people say, and you know whether it's you know true or false, whatever you you're aware you know of how it affects you, and then in terms of uh, you know the lifestyle, then you you conform action speech to the way we the core what or the Vinaya according to the monastery you're living in. So you're, you know, you're not trying to even cling to Vinaya. It has to be like this or it's wrong. But you're, you know, you're just, it's a, it's an agreed way to live, you know, so that you're, you're not endlessly negotiating about the externals. You're kind of making it easy to, if you do it like this, so then 
you can observe your own, you know, loves, hates, uh, aversions, criticisms, complaints, from this position of, of observing rather than judging. Like if, when you start criticizing, like if you, if you feel anger towards somebody here, and then somebody says, you shouldn't, a good monk shouldn't be angry, and then, then I'm making you feel <clears throat> guilty. So say you're, you're angry with me, and then I say, if you were a good monk, you wouldn't be angry. You would have conquered anger. <laughs> and then, and then you, you start feeling guilty about it. You know, but if you're, if you're trusting in your awareness, and you, you have confidence in that, then, and I say, you, you know, a good monk shouldn't be angry. You can be aware of, of uh, your own, you know, reaction to my uh, scolding or, or uh, kind of telling you how you should be is like this. And, and so, you're, you know, this gives you the foundation to observe from, to investigate Dhamma. Because if you're just operating from what others tell you, then it... It, it, it can be very good advice, but it's still you aren't seeing what you're doing. You're, you're merely believing in what a teacher says without observing this, you know, your own grasping of their teaching. And uh, you hear a lot of, you know, Ajahn Chah said, and Ajahn Chah's way. The people quote Ajahn Chah all over the place. You know, uh, it, it <laughs> makes it, you know, it's like... <clears throat> God, you know, makes pronouncements. That, and so this is, uh, this is, uh, you know, understandable. I mean, I've, I've done it myself, so I'm not, you know, not particularly blameless on that level. But, but uh, also, it's not, not to be encouraged for you to just think that, that you know, you, what what the great teacher says is is absolutely right all the time, but you can you know because it's a kind of grasping of some of what somebody else says. So that's the you know that's the emphasis is is opening to this grasping this avicca ignorance of dhamma uh, desire that comes out of that ignorance and grasping of desire. So you. Those three, you know, if you, you know, we have this, this is the causes of suffering, of dukkha, grasping desire out of ignorance. So then to, to uh, you know, ignorance then is, is not kind of being illiterate or anything. It just means not being aware of the way it is, of not, of not recognizing Dhamma in the present. So, so in, the, in this way then you're, what I'm trying to encourage you to do is be open to the present and observe. And observe here rather than, you know, just be aware of what this monk says or how they do things or, you know, compare it to Korean tradition or, you know, and to caught up in, in trying to sort it all out on, on the thinking, with a thinking mind. Because you can really develop from this, you know, like, like uh, authority people uh, you know you meet people with very strong sense of authority and with uh, a lot of uh, strong views and uh, and they can quote scriptures to back them up and so this is found very intimidating personally you know so, so, so somebody says well, in the Sutta Nipata, this the Buddha said this. This is, you know, this is a kind of peremptory kind of, you know, it's, the Scripture says this, and this is the Word of God, and and saying it in a very confident, <laughs> a, absolutely confident way, and then I'd feel very intimidated. You see, emotionally, I found that intimidating. So, so then, through seeing that, then I observe this, this, how I, you know, not that I'm trying to, to disprove anything, but to use the situation for observing my own 
feeling of when, when, when somebody speaks with great authority and knowledge, it feels like this. And, uh, and trusting that, it, to be aware of it, because it is a reaction, emotional reaction to, to uh, you know, the, to people that have a lot of confidence have a lot of knowledge about something. In this holy life, you know, that you know, you're living in a world with with strong views about right and wrong all the time. <laughs> about God. About <laughs> I see basically um, that the body conditions the mind and vice versa. So how can one see it beyond that uh, illusion? Like the, the relationship is always that awareness is the, is the way. And, and the body, like you can be aware of your body now as experience. So, or aware of your emotional state or your thoughts or memories that, and so this is like your this awareness uh, includes the body and the con mental states and and so therefore it's more like you know like the western mind we tend to say consciousness is something in your brain you know, at least I did. You know, I had this idea that that it's in in here. But then, in in meditation, like Kayanu Pasna Satipatthani, I'm actually aware of the body as experience here and now. So posture, breathing, and and uh, physical vedana, you know, play, pain and whatever. So you're, it's kind of vibratory. Uh, realities uh, you're aware of is, is that are happening here and now, and that's in, so the the body is in the consciousness, and then uh, then the self, the sense, you, how you see yourself as a person, it changes according to the conditions, you know. So the, you know according to the weather or the, whether you're being praised or blamed or whatever. So you. But that awareness is a constant. It's something that has it. It sustains itself. It's not you don't create it. That's where this uh, this is recognizing it. Like Four Noble Truths is all about recognizing, realize. Like Four Third Noble Truth is about realizing the cessation of conditions. And you just even when you know love, hate, and that cease, and you still there's still consciousness. And awareness. So you're, you know, you're you're learning to con this connected mindfulness, uh, where you're, you know, through not through trying to hold on to anything, but through letting go of everything. And then, uh, then whether the body and the body is a is some sankarani cha, you know, fire, all conditions are impermanent, and so is the sanya sankara. Uh, Vedana Sankara, Sanya Sankara Vijnana. And then it, Vijnana is sense consciousness. So your senses, you know, whether you're conscious through the eyes, ears, nose, uh, tongue, body. But then there's a, you know, consciousness isn't dependent on the senses, it's, it's behind the senses. So sensual things arise and cease. So, you, you know, you're. You're, with awareness and consciousness and wisdom, it's like you're informing consciousness with wisdom. So, like Ajahn Chah say, "Obrom, you know, Obrom to Eng, Panya, to, to rather than out of ignorance or uh, cultural biases or opinions." So, like, like this. Uh, Cessation when 
you know, just in the here and now, you feel something, you, you're aware of its presence, and then it ceases. You know, that's a discerning. You're discerning the presence and absence of, a, of an emotion or a thought or a memory. And that awareness is the constant factor in all that, where the, where the, uh, the uh, emotion changes, you know, different emotions arise through various conditions. You know, so whether you're happy or sad depends on the conditions to, for happiness or sadness. But, but awareness isn't happy or sad. It's, it's, uh, it allows you to, to observe in consciousness, through consciousness, the arising and cessation of emotions, of sensory impingement, of a physical uh, Vedana. So this is this is a relationship then of the condi- unconditioned and the conditioned. So, like for me now, the unconditioned is reality; it's real, and then the conditioned are, you know, it's a fact. Where before, you know, I didn't, I thought I'd never, I thought, in condition, I can't figure that one out. And, uh, <laughs> you know, just beyond me, you know, <laughs> I, here I am with my problems and my feelings and habits and emotions and this, this, this whole conditioning was so strong, you know, sense of my reality is me and my personality and my emotional world. Is, is real to me. And now, after all these years, you just see it in terms of it's Dhamma rather than seeing it, you know, giving it any sense of um, anything more than what it is in the present. And the reality is, you know, like Third Noble Truth is, is reality, is realizing. And then, it, you know, to cultivate, to, uh, what is it, realize cessation. Cessation then of conditioned phenomena is reality, is where conditions arise and cease. That's here in your jitta, you know. The, uh, here you see, you can observe the emotions, love, hate, like, dislike, come and, you know, rise and cease. And so it's in the, in the here and now. And your, your refuge is in, the, in awareness, in Buddha Dhamma Sangha, and then you have then you have this perspective on your own personal assumptions, your emotional habits, fears and desires and whatnot. You have perspective. They don't mean you don't have any feelings anymore, but you have your relationship to them is knowing rather than clinging. It's like like consciousness is knowing. This is a conscious realm that we're experiencing. And and it's now we know things from this, you know, when, we're, when we have a form, like a human body, then we know from this point. You know, so I see you from this point, and, and you're in, in the consciousness now. I'm, I'm looking at you, you're in, in consciousness. Now I can't see my own face at this moment, I can see your face. But, so this, this consciousness then is, is, you know, being born as a human entity, is you're, you're experiencing the universe from this one point of this form. Now then, the, then your relationship to the universe then is, is not to see yourself as this form and, and limited and bound into this condition, personality and in human identity with the, with the physical body, but the the awakened, like Buddha Dhamma Sang, is awakened consciousness, but still operating from this point. So you ex, you know you're experiencing your experience is, is observing rather than the, is being the knowing the puto knowing tammo knowing dhamma Buddha knowing dhamma rather than this person trying to get something or get rid of something or become something. And that's where, you know, like the, the, uh, um, 
for me now this sense of Bhutang Sernangachami, you know, the kind of Theravada Buddhism, you know, ceremony, and people they we take the five three, the three refuges and the five precepts and say your Bhutang Sernangachami. Then so it can be just perfunctory chanting or ceremony. But to me, you know, they contemplate what is a refuge? What do you mean by sarana and refuge? And then you, it's a place, you know, when you go to a refuge, you're looking for a safe place to be. You know, refuge is, in the English sense of refuge, it goes for safety to a refuge. Well, right now, what is the only refuge, the safety, you know? Like we could, I could pull out a gun and I don't have one. <laughs> I mean, this, this realm here is very uncertain. The sky could fall in or... <laughs> A uh, suicide bomber could blow himself up and I mean so in, even though these are not likely at this time you know monasteries are fairly generally considered safe places to be but they can also you know you know recognize that just refuge in a place is not not a real refuge so then you this awareness is the only refuge because it's it's with you all the time you know whether you're here or in Iraq or wherever you have this awareness and this is, this is actually uh, you know where what you can trust and then this is what you can recognize for yourself and realize it and, to, and cultivate like fourth noble truth is cultivating awareness so that your samaditi sama sangapo is you know your right understanding right intention and everything comes together there and it, it's developing it because at first insight might be just a flash or something you know you might get a kind of flash of insight and then it's easy to just fall back into the old habit patterns of me and mine and whatnot but also after that initial flash something in you does change that you may not be aware of when you, life gets difficult you think oh I've been meditating how many years and I still get angry and selfish and whatnot and then you feel you're not getting anywhere or more and more you stop believing that and, and trusting more in awareness and then it, so then in Bhutan uh, Sernangachami to me that just a not beautiful thing to be able to say and be able to think taking refuge in the Buddha but it really is it's not just sentimental religious uh, idealism but it's it's reality itself you know it's awareness itself it's real it's 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 recognizable it's not abstract or subtle or refined or precious it's it's obs observable knowable here and now and you are that, you know, you're, you're not what you think you are, but this is, you know, in terms of using language, you are this awareness. This awareness is your true nature. Before you become this person, this personality or this body, Like right now, you you can just listen to the the sound of the cicadas, and then you can you know, to to open the sense of opening wide. It's not like concentrating narrow. It's not samatha, but it's it's opening wide, and this is a sense of embracing the present. So you. So you, you just notice what first comes up, like the sense, the cicadas are the most obvious sound I'm hearing now. And the kind of ringing insect sounds. And then as you kind of relax more, and you're not just focused on that, you begin to notice a 
subtle sound behind it all, or a vibration. So it's more attitude of, of opening, listening, receiving, relaxing. Because like, like so much of, you know, on a, my problems with meditation were, were this uh, obsessiveness, like trying to concentrate. And now I began to notice like concentrating on an object tends to make me more tense. I tend to contract the body. And, and you know, so there's a different, you become aware of it, this, this kind of intensity of concentrating on something in which I'm trying to control, you know, get rid of everything and just focus on one thing. Where this is the opposite, where you're opening to everything, you know, to... And it's more like using the ability to listen. Because, you know, hearing is... is a sense of listening and hearing is, is with you all the time, whether you're in a dark room or in a jungle or a city or alone, whatever. All the time, you know, even if uh, it's the practice in the London Underground, just sound of silence, see, you know. <laughs> quite, quite pleasant. You know, so uh, London Underground, uh, quite pleasant for me. <laughs> <laughs> in the uh, traffic jams in Bangkok, or, and, or in, in London, you know, so you, your, your attitude changes from, you know, controlling and trying to make things, you know, according to one's desires to just receiving and listening. So I, you see, when, when I, I found like this, there's, in the calendar, you know, did, did I give you one of the Kamramati calendars? Well, the first, the January month, you know, there's a picture of me on it. But it also has this, my favorite verse from the scripture. And so it says, there is the unborn, uncreated, unformed, unoriginated. Therefore, there is the escape from the born, the created, the form, and the originated. So this is, this has always been my, this I've always found the most profound, pure metaphysical statement in in any in any religion or philosophy. Because it's, it's just so precise, you know, and and it 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 uses like the created, the form, the originated, the condition. This is this you, this we can imagine, you know. So you know, just in the word in language, you know, you have. You can imagine, even fantasies, you can imagine ghosts out there or, or uh, you know, cr create fantasy world in different colors, different forms. Uh, and then, so the formed and the created, the originated, the born, is what we're generally stuck with, what we're, we're attached to. And then this is always, you know, in Buddhist terms, this is the cause of something, being blindly attached to the created, the form, the originated, the born, is that we're always in this, we suffer from fear and anxiety, fear of death, uh, self-consciousness, we're always subject to, to some form of humiliation or pain or, you know, so with self-consciousness, we're, we're, in, we're in what others think, uh, only the whole sense of a personality and and uh, cultural conditioning is based on the formed and the condition and the created so then but then the statement is there is the unborn uncreated unformed unoriginated you can't imagine that you know your mind actually your thinking mind stops trying to imagine something unformed that unformed unborn unoriginated you know, because it's where anything born or created originated, you can imagine something or other, create some, some form, some, some quality or quantity or color or whatever, shape. But this is where you begin to notice that which is aware, where the thinking mind ceases. And Nibbana also, your mind ceases. When you try to 
conceive Nibbana or Anatta. You know, what do you do? You know, usually they now Nibbana is a in the West is used as a kind of heavenly realm. So they say, Oh, I you know, I went to the Canary Islands and I was in Nibbana, you know. What, what the <laughs> Sorry, the it's used, and even in Thailand, they use it as, in terms of the highest happiness. You know, so, let, you recognize the limitation of thinking and language is that the highest, Buddha wasn't pointing to highest happiness at all. He's pointing to the Majjhima Bhattipata, which is not high, it's here and now. It's not an attainment that you have to get through doing anything, you know, and and becoming anything. So it, then it's, but so Nibbana is kind of a word that leaves your mind blank, or anatta, non-self. And, and so people tend to think that non-self is like, you just become, you know, you're kind of a zombie or you're dead, brain dead or something, you know, you no longer think anything. You know, the, the idea of being, you know, being an arhat can sound like you're just kind of sitting there with no feelings or, you know, nothing going on in your mind. But it's not like that. You, you know, you're the, the thinking process then is is not to be grasped, but it's just, you know, something to use, but not grasp or identify with. So then, you, this sense of the unborn, uncreated is recognized through awareness, through just letting go of everything and observing, being fully attentive, paying attention to the present, listening, in other words, in this wide kind of receiving way. And then, then I found the reason why I like that, develop that, was because of my obsessive thinking habits. And, and I found, you know, that when I recognize the sound of silence, then the thinking process ceases. So I'm still aware. I'm not thinking about it. You know, there's a sense of total attention to the present. But it's not seeking, looking for anything to focus on. It's just a state of, of what, of, uh, it's ekagatta in other words, it's, it's uh, what ekagatta really is, or one-pointedness, it's not, it's not a point there, but it's this one point of wholeness or completeness. And then from that you get the perspective on the, you can you see the conditions, you can be aware of your own habits, uh, your feel like obsessive feelings or, or uh, fears or self-consciousness. Like I, I've always suffered from self-consciousness. And so the, you know, this um, just having, and then I find myself in this position where everybody's looking at me. It's ironic. And when I became a monk, actually, my idea was to disappear from the world. I thought going off into the jungles living, disappearing from life would be, was what, you know, what I really found uh, appealing to me. And then the opposite has happened. I've become the center of, of a group. So I've had to look at that, you know, the, the anxiety and the sense of self that being, a, you know, the object of, of, of other people's attention. So then, you know, seeing that now if I start thinking about it, then, I, you know, I, I can start suffering or resenting or doubting, whatever. But because of this sound of silence practice, I just develop this sense of resting in this to where the self disappears, the self-consciousness goes. And then, then, then you can, you know, then your thinking process is much more of a skillful means rather than an obsessive habitual pattern of thinking and reason and logic and views and opinions. So, you know, like the way it is or Benyang, Ni Ang, Buddhadasas, 
advice, you know, suchness, da da da, you know, the sense of it's like this, the Dhamma is this way, you know, it's, it's, it's here and now, it's not, it's not defined and, and described, it's, it's recognizable though. So you, through awareness and attention, you're recognizing Dhamma. It's recognizable, but you can't describe it. As soon as you start trying to describe it, then you're caught back into trying to describe because words, descriptions only deal with form things and make judgments, value judgments, that, uh, you know, according to right and wrong, good and bad. But awareness puts you in a state of pure, pure consciousness without this, this, uh, this distortion of uh, clinging to condition, emotions or perceptions that you create views and opinions that you have. But you begin to see them, you know, you're not, it doesn't mean you don't have any, but you're observing them from this rather than, you know, getting caught into them. <coughs>